<clears throat> Pardon me, darling. This is your ancestor, Sheree. Yeah, I can hear your ancestor, Sheree. I know this video has been a trauma-filled and emotional experience for you, child. I've been watching you processing for the last month now. Would you be so kind as to let me tap in here, give you a little break? Maybe I can speak to the people. I have a few words, particularly for white women. Well, that sounds lovely, giving me a little break. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course you can speak to the people. Sure. Um, hey guys, so my, my ancestor, Cherie, she wanted to say a few words. I'm going to take a little break and let her take this little part. Okay, you be nice. You be nice to the people, okay? I'll catch you guys. Catch you guys a little bit later. Well, hi, y'all. I'm Pasha's ancestor, Shuri, and I'm here to give you a little history on black mothers in America. I know this video essay has been so traumatic for her, so I decided to come in and give it this part because this part going to be a little traumatic too. So first of all, I don't even understand why these white mothers trying to come out and raise our babies in the first place. Like I'm not even sure if white women have started raising their own children even today. It's the audacity that after centuries of stealing our children's us literally giving your children the milk of life. It's never enough for you white women. You've destroyed your own culture, your own families, and now you come over our children. But I guess y'all's always been coming over our children. Let me remind you of some history. See, back in slavery times when I was alive, me and my sister had a quota. We had to have five babies by the time we was 21, started when we was 13. My enslaver even tried to promise me my freedom. Wasn't about to have five babies by the time I was 21, though. I tell it like we had a choice. There was no choice. One of my fellow enslaved ladies, Mary, she was found to be infertile at 14, got sold off to a whole nother plantation. I see the women of the Confederacy were able to rewrite a lot of this history, but I want to remind you that there were breeding camps. Yes, I said that, breeding camps. Meaning that black people were treated like cattle and they were brought together at a camp so they could make us habitually R-A-P-E each other and produce more enslaved peoples to be able to keep up their psychopathic, genocidal, capitalistic domain. There's a common misconception among my fellow black men that being light-skinned back in my time gave you some sort of privilege. Now I will be just completely dishonest to not say that yes, oftentimes lighter skinned enslaved peoples were found to be more attractive to the enslavers. But as this ancestral blood shows you, children, beauty comes in all colors and enslavers saw all of them. Although the mixed children of enslavers and their mistresses oftentimes received material privileges, gifts, clothes, the bondage that these mistresses was in was habitual R.I.P.E. child as well as a constant torture and abuse from the enslaver's wife. Just breaks my heart when I look down and see my descendants still perpetuating the patriarchy that those white enslavers instilled on our culture. Wait, how do y'all say it? That ain't us, boo. And I see how my lovely child Posh is laid out in this video, how they still be stealing our children's. After centuries, we thought these white people, white people, these white people, White people, white people. Would have learned enough humanity to stop selling our children for profit and labor, but I see that not much has changed. Enslaved black women were always treated as less valuable than enslaved black men, and it just tortures my soul to see that we still participate in this practice today. Colonized people were never ever really able to express themselves freely when it comes to sexuality. So their sexuality was stolen from them through the lack of consent of RIPE, white colonizers, to the enslaved women and the enslaved men. Oh, I think that's another video essay topic. Maybe talking about consent and the generational trauma that has to do with sexuality within enslaved people. Probably another video essay topic. Did I get out of character? I'm my bad, y'all. Yes, child, that's a splendid idea. Make sure I get to come back for that video. You know, Posh gets all her kinky stuff from my side of the family. So in conclusion, white women have been stealing and selling our babies 
the hundreds of years, even though they haven't been able to even raise their own. So why women? I'm gonna go back to my original statement. When did y'all start being mothers? And why the fuck do you think you can raise our children? Not like for real though, white mothers, why the fuck do y'all think that you could be raising our children's better than we could raise our children's? I really need to understand why the Oh my goodness. I'm so sorry guys. She Ancestor Sherry, she's going through a lot, you know, she processed a lot. She really been grieving the fact that uh you know, that our people are going to let humanity go extinct before we liberate ourselves, you know. She's just real tired of seeing her people struggle. And, uh, but I apologize. I should make sure she knows not to just be cussing at people. Black historian W.E.B. Du Bois recognized over a century ago that black women formed the essential core of the black family. And he also recognized that the structure of white supremacy was dead set on the destruction of the strength and pride of African notions of matriarchy, family, and community. The sociocultural enforcement of the nuclear family model worked to erode the molds that Africans had long thrived on and carried out in their tradition, weakening and dismantling cooperative models of communal living, community fostering, space sharing, fictive kinship, social fathering, and strength in the face of oppression. From Rosewood, to Seneca Village. When the LBJ administration put out the infamous patronizing Moynihan Report, describing the Negro community as retarded by a matriarchal structure that weakened the ability of black men to function as authority figures, it enforced the perception of non-nuclear family models as deviant, criminalized black womanhood as emasculating and abusive, and sought to rally black men for the task of establishing patriarchal power over black women. Our home is a two-story house, the white folks. These recorded memories we were among thousands of interviews done with ex-slaves in the 1930s and 40s. Can you remember slavery days very well? Of course, I remember all our white folks and all the names of them, all the children. Call every one of the children's names. Who, who did you belong to? Jim Button, the baby boy. I think it is very important that we talk about the atrocities of slavery. Our history that we learn in school has been completely sanitized and whitewashed, and there are so many different horrific stories that need to be shared so that the atrocities, savagery, psychopathy, and long-lasting consequences that are the genocidal slavery that built the foundation of this country. One of those very commonly unknown facts is that enslavers actually created breeding camps. And yes, that is exactly what you are thinking. White American enslavers created camps for enslaved females to live and give birth. These camps had 1940s concentration camp-like conditions, but in the 1800s. What these were were essentially RAPE factories to produce more enslaved people for profit. And whether sex was with an enslaver or another enslaved person, an enslaved person cannot consent, and so all sex under slavery was RAPE. In 1808, the Cotton Kingdom was in full swing, and it required laborers. The Quakers were looking to ban the Atlantic slave trade, and eventually it was abolished. In 1808, the U.S. ended its participation in the international slave trade. The only way to increase the number of slaves in the U.S. was through the female slave giving birth to future slaves. The female slave had become a product themselves, much like cotton. They were a commodity used to make white men wealthy. And a sanitized version of this still exists today. In this case, it was the slave woman's fertility used as the commodity. The slaveholders used passages from the Bible to condone their heinous acts. Congress at the time wanted to keep the value of the slaves up by removing themselves from the international slave trade, decreasing the external supply for top-valued home-brewed slaves. <laughs> 
This is the same idea as the coined phrase made in America in today's standards, but without the labor costs. Breeding and producing slaves exceeded tobacco in exports. Female slaves in the state of Virginia exceeded males by over 300,000. They were all used to breed the future slave population of America. Many slave farm breeders would participate in relations with their breeding products, obviously against any consent due to their master-slave relationship. In turn, offspring was common, even with heads of state in the new American nation. TV and movies depict many boats with slaves arriving in New Orleans. What they leave out is these boats are coming from Virginia. Many escaped slaves wrote about their experience in books like Slave Narratives and the American Slave Coast. Breeders could rely on future demand to increase prices. This is why Thomas Jefferson supported the abolishment of the Atlantic slave trade. He wanted Virginia to export slaves, not import them, with no other competitive source. In a Medium article in June 2019, William Spivey wrote, It's worth noting that the Constitution of the United States, in addition to establishing the Electoral College to protect slave states and valuing slaves at three-fifths of a person while giving them no rights, specifically forbid banning the importation of slavery prior to 1808. Quote, Article 1, Section 9, Constitution of the United States. The migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808, but a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation, not exceeding $10 for each person. Americans did not take up breeding slaves in response to congressional action. That action was taken at the behest of slave breeders as a protectionist means to keep the price of their product up. Jefferson's home state, Virginia, was the leading producer of slaves. Slavery eventually exceeded tobacco as the leading export. Maryland was second in slave production, followed by several other states. Generally speaking, it was the house slaves that got RAP'd the most. Some mothers had to protect their offspring from the master's wife if she had a reason to believe her spouse was the father. We're generally aware of the situation which we've been led to believe was the worst case scenario. Nobody talks about the 13 year old girl on the breeding farm forced to bear as many children as possible only to have them ripped away and sent down south to endure a lifetime of hardship without a mother. On one breeding farm, the mother would be freed after birthing 15 children, but what would she have to look forward to? American slaves in 1860 were worth $4 billion, which was far more than the $228 million worth of gold and silver circulating back then. Even the value of Southern farmland, $1.92 billion, did not amount to the worth of the slaves. So for the owners, their slaves were worth everything to them. In an article written by Jason Koki, February 2nd, 2016, A History of the Slave Breeding Industry in the United States, he writes, because slaves were property, Southern slave owners could mortgage them to banks, and then banks could package the mortgages into bonds and sell the bonds to anyone, anywhere in the world, even where slavery was illegal. In the 1830s, powerful Southern slave owners wanted to import capital into their states so they could buy more slaves. They came up with a new two-part idea, mortgaging slaves, and then turning the mortgages into bonds that could be marketed all over the world. First, American planters organized new banks, usually in new states like Mississippi and Louisiana, drawing up list of slaves for collateral. The planters then mortgaged them to the banks they had created, enabling themselves to buy additional slaves to expand cotton production. To provide capital for those loans, the banks sold bonds to investors from around the globe, London, New York, Amsterdam, Paris. The bond buyers, many of whom lived in countries where slavery was illegal, didn't own individual slaves, just bonds backed by their value. Planters' mortgage payments paid the interest and the principal on these bond payments. Enslaved human beings had been, in modern financial lingo, securitized. Slaved backed securities. Securities backed by enslaved human beings. 
President James Polk speculated in slaves based on inside information he obtained from being president and shaping policy towards slaves and slave importation. A speculator is a person who invests in stocks, property, or other ventures in the hope of making a profit. And in this instance, the property were enslaved humans. Thomas Jefferson bragged to George Washington that the birth of black children was increasing Virginia's capital stock by 4% annually. As long as the slave power continued to grow, breeders could literally bank on future demand and increasing prices. 12.7 million Africans were forced onto ships to the Western Hemisphere during the Atlantic slave trade. Estimates have only around 400 to 500,000 of those landing in present-day America. The transatlantic slave trade was abolished in 1807, and by 1860, 4 million black slaves were in present-day America. That's an increase of 3.5 million African enslaved humans that were bred for profit. Virginia produced slaves as their main domestic crop. The price of slaves was anchored by industry in other states that consumed slaves in the production of rice and sugar and constant territorial expansion. Constant territorial expansion basically means they were manifesting their destiny by murdering indigenous people and taking their land. brought over 500 enslaved Africans. And in less than 60 years, you got a 600% return on that investment. It makes you wonder who really was the savages or is the savages. In an article by Thomas Bramer, published February 6, 2021, he states, In the United States, reparations to slave owners in Washington, D.C. were paid at the height of the Civil War. On April 16, 1862, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Act for the Release of Certain Persons Held to Service or Labor Within the District of Columbia into law. It gave former slave owners $300 per enslaved person set free. More than 3,100 enslaved people saw their freedom paid for in this way, for a total cost in an in excess of $930,000, almost $25 million in today's money. In contrast, the formerly enslaved received nothing if they decided to stay in the United States. The act provided for an immigration incentive of $100, around $2,683 in 20 2021. If the former enslaved agreed to permanently leave the United States, they paid our enslavers, gave us no reparations, but offered to pay if we would leave the country. U.S. history does not acknowledge breeding farms much, and mostly that is because of its complacency in the act for so many years until the Civil War. At the age of 15, enslavers would start to inspect male slaves to see if they were good stock to be bred. If they were not considered profitable, they were castrated. Male enslaved peoples had a quota to impregnate at least 12 female enslaved people. White male enslavers would sometimes entertain their guest by bringing their best specimen or their most attractive enslaved people and forcing them to perform a public orgy or giving them away to other enslavers for their sexual pleasure. It was very common for black men to be bought and sold and valued based on their penis size. This was due to scientific misconceptions about fertility. Male enslavers that were gay and some that were also straight would R-A-P-E, male enslaved people. This process was called breaking the buck. The slave was then flogged to tenderize the flesh for the sodomy that followed multiple times. This form of punishment was done in full view of the slave family and friends to instill fear in the hopes to prevent future rebellion. Men of bondage who were victims of this inhumane, sadistic, homoerotic, emasculating punishment often ran away from the plantations or killed themselves as the humiliation was much too strong to overcome. 
there are multiple levels of psychological torture and reprogramming through this process. One of the goals is to demasculate the male enslaved person, as well as clearly set the hierarchy of the plantation. Racist white male society's perception of breaking a man's will to fight. I wanted to also touch on a point that I don't think gets brought up enough, but there is a very unique experience for male enslaved people during slavery in America. No enslaved person can consent to sex under slavery, but being desired by the white enslaver looked much different if you were a male enslaved person or a female enslaved person. I'm just gonna take a moment to pour one out for all of my fellow queer and transgender folks, ancestors that lived through slavery. I can't even imagine what that mind torture prison must have been. An enslaved female had at least a probability that if she was desired by a white enslaver, it could lead to material benefit. Whereas black enslaved men dealt with the very nuanced situation of not being able to say no to either gendered enslaver, but particularly white female enslavers. A female enslaver or an enslaver's wife, if they approached an enslaved man, that could be that man's life. So he cannot say no. He also has to go through the trauma of being RAPE'd while also being enslaved and an added layer of anxiety that his life is probably over now. I can't really even process what that must have been like or what that general tra trauma looks like and how it's presenting in our black community. I am just grateful for people like FD Signifier who are exploring and educating people about these topics and being a good role model for Black men. Thomas Foster says that although historians have begun to cover sexual abuse during slavery, few focus on sexual abuse of men and boys because of the assumption that only enslaved women were victimized. Foster suggests that men and boys may have also been forced into unwanted sexual activity. One problem in documenting such abuse is that they, of course, did not bear mixed race children. Both masters and mistresses were thought to have abused male slaves. And honestly, history can't admit this or the country would have to reconcile with the fact that it was led by enslavers who were habitual rapists and a lot who were sexually fluid, at least. It also destroys the fantasy world of the nuclear family. Gender placed a figurative price ceiling on enslaved women's value, even though, as we'll see, they were often expected to do the exact same labor as enslaved men. The deeply entrenched patriarchy in European cultures extended across racial lines and played a significant role in shaping African captives' monetary worth. And even though enslaved women were not sold at the same high price range as enslaved men, their value to those who purchased them was absolutely clear. In many regions of the colonies, enslaved women's ability to reproduce was hugely important. Buying a laborer who could bear children meant that once those children got older, the enslaver could either exploit that child's labor or sell that child for a profit. Children, especially young girls, were often subjugated to sexual abuse by their masters, their master's children and relatives. Since these women had no control over where they went or what they did, their masters could manipulate them into situations of high risk, forcing them into a dark field or making them sleep in the master's bedroom to be available for service. Free or white women could charge their perpetrators with RAPE, but slave women had no legal recourse. Their bodies legally belonged to their owners. The sexual violence that black women experienced took on many different forms. There was even a practice called the fancy trade, designed specifically for the sale of mixed race women for sexual concubinage and prostitution. In 1937, a formerly enslaved man, W.L. Bost, explains some of these dynamics to an interviewer for the Federal Writers Project, a New Deal era initiative which recorded the oral testimonies of over 2,300 formerly enslaved people in the late 1930s. As we mentioned before, black testimonies were often filtered through white perspectives. So when published, these conversations in the Federal Writers Project were often written with a heavy dialect attributed to the black interviewees. Bost is reported as having said, plenty of the colored women have children by the white men. 
she know better than to not do what he say. They take them very same children, would have their own blood, and make slaves out of them. Alex Haley's Queen, The Story of an American Family, is a historical novel, later a movie, that brought knowledge of the children of the plantation to the public attention. Edward Ball's Slaves in the Family, written by a white descendant of slave owners, describes this complex legacy. Toni Morrison wrote that this sexual usage of slaves was also known as droit du Seigneur, or the right of the Lord, a term originating in the feudalism of medieval Europe. Children of the Plantation was a euphemism used during time of slavery in the United States to identify the offspring born to black female slaves and white men, usually the slave's owner, one of the owner's relatives, or the plantation overseer. Genetic research in 1998 estimated that nearly 20% of the African American's genetic contribution originates from Europe, which is much higher than the European contribution in Jamaicans or Haitians. In a February 2021 article titled America's History, Sexual Abuse of Black Slaves by Ratika Gupta, they write, sexual abuse was more about power and less about sex. Corporal punishments function as displays of power that constituted sexual violence against enslaved men. Though many slaves tried to fight back and resist, it resulted in bad outcomes. Furthermore, court records and letters from the 1800s reveal that white women, not just men, took advantage of their power. In Rethinking Rufus, Sexual Violations of Enslaved Men, historian Thomas Foster thoroughly examined how the conditions of slavery gave rise to sexual violence against enslaved men and women. Foster also notes the trauma of coerced reproduction, a form of sexual violence where enslaved men and women were forced to bear children in order to increase the population of enslaved people. Using interviews and testimonies from former enslaved men, he highlights that those who had high reproductive capabilities were often singled out from their communities and relocated to different regions. They were then forced to couple with multiple partners. These men were excused by masters from performing certain types of laborious activities as they feared it could negatively affect their reproductive capabilities. This subject is so taboo because evidence for the sexual abuse of male slaves is harder to come by compared to that of females. The topic has largely gone unexplored. Also, society tends to define RAPE along gendered lines, which makes both victims and perpetrators reluctant to discuss male RAPE. Scholars of the sexual abuse of enslaved women have highlighted the violent RAPE's exploitative relationships and concubinage that took place between enslaved women and their slavers. And I just want to add in that any R.A.P.E. or just sex while being enslaved is a violent R.A.P.E. Violence is not just done physically. Violence can be done mentally, metaphysically, spiritually, psychologically. So there weren't any exploitative relationships or concubines. It was all violent R.A.P.E. Far less research has focused on black men as sexual victims. The emasculation they suffered under slavery, it has often been said, was the denial of patriarchal authority and control of dependents, wives, and children. But enslaved men were also forced to reproduce with enslaved women, and in many other ways too, they had little control of their bodies and intimacies. Like we previously mentioned, a lot of the enslaved people that came over in the Atlantic slave trade were from matriarchal communities. So the authority and control of a patriarchal society and the lack of power within femme presenting people was probably hard to even comprehend or understand. 19th century accounts from court records and former slaves reveal that white women also took advantage of their positions of power over slaves and at times abused that power to gain sexual access to black men and to assert their authority. Such a history has remained largely hidden, buried under the enduring stereotypes of, of white women as passive and vulnerable and black men as hypersexual and powerful. Thomas Thistlewood, an 18th century Jamaican planter, noted in his diary incidents of homosexual assault. Thistlewood mentioned that the homosexual act occurred between an enslaver and his enslaved boy who was a close personal servant of his. 
A question that poses, is it possible that the sexual abuse occurred because the boy was in close proximity to his enslaver? Foster helps answer this question by stating that this type of abuse follows a broader pattern that suggests that closer proximity to whites, the more likely the sexual abuse was to occur. Gendered perceptions of rape, lack of information, and a lack of education have caused us to leave out an important part of history and conform to the white slave owner's belief that black men were the sexual predators, not the victims. Without recognizing this, we fail to recognize the truth that sexual assault occurred to both enslaved women and enslaved men. In an anonymous analysis of sexual relations between elite white women and enslaved men in the antebellum South, a social historical analysis, the writer says, not all sexual encounters between masters and female enslaved people would be considered RAP according to most definitions of the term. Concubage type of arrangements and even long-term romantic partnership, perhaps most famously that of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, were known to exist. Yet many scholars would agree that even presumably affectionate and long-term relationships must be reconsidered given the context of slavery. The enormous imbalance of gender and racial power between the two parties problemizes the notion of a truly consensual romantic relationship between an enslaver and a female enslaved person. These so-called consensual sexual partnerships can be seen, like RAP, as an exercise in white patriarchal authority. There was no consensual sex under slavery. You cannot consent to sex if you are enslaved. As guardians of the home, planter-class white women were responsible for upholding traditional Christian values and keeping peace within the domestic sphere. Planter-class was the aristocrat or bourgeoisie of the South. As such, they were valued for their homemaking abilities, maternal instinct, and perhaps above all else, their virtue. Which is kind of hilariously ironic because they weren't doing any of the homemaking. The human beings that they enslaved were. I'm not sure where they got their maternal instinct from since they also weren't raising any of their children. I would like to think that a few of them kept their virtue, but given everything else that we've learned during this video essay, I doubt it. Also given my experience with the amount of Christian white women that lie about their virginity today. Which is interesting because according to historian Elizabeth Fox Genovis, slave holding culture emphasized control of female sexuality. It did not deny its existence. She says that white women had a striking lack of neurotic inhibition. Like their husbands, Southern women had pre and extra marital sex. If you want to be fully convinced of the abominations of slavery, go on a southern plantation and call yourself a Negro trader. Then there will be no concealment and you will see and hear things that will seem to you impossible among human beings with immortal souls. Harriet Ann Jacobs. Harriet Ann Jacobs is basically saying, if you want to know how racist white people are, you need to hear what they say in when we're not around. And you know who hears that? The black people that white people surround themselves with. Why female enslavers chose to sexually abuse slaves probably varied by situation. Perhaps some of them were simply bored or sexually frustrated, but perhaps at least on a subconscious level, sexually exploiting enslaved people was a means of compensating for their lack of power in other aspects of their lives. Again, planter class women were considered the property of their husbands and lacked considerable sexual agency relative to men. It is possible the sexual exploitation of enslaved people by women who had little power in relation to white men was a source of enjoyment that created a feeling of power. Sadistic, narcissistic power. It is important to note that the cases of RAPE would probably not have been seen as such by the wives of sexually abusive enslavers who bought into the idea of the hypersexualized, un rap -able Black Jezebel. The saying goes, she is presumed to be always willing. This view is articulated most famously by Susan Brown Miller in Against Our Will, Men, Women, and RAPE in 1975. Former slaves Harriet Jacobs, Charles Ball, and Frederick Douglass all mentioned in their autobiographies that their mistresses, their female enslavers, were often crueler, meaner, and more violent than their masters. Enslaved ladies' maids or enslaved house mistresses could serve revolutionary roles as pipelines of information to other enslaved peoples on a plantation. 
enslaved house mistresses were in charge of the enslaver's wife. They were responsible for dressing and changing her. They trained in the care of clothing, hairdressing, makeup creation, and application. They oftentimes were stylists and were expected to keep up on the latest fashions as they followed their lady enslaver about town. They made dresses, they made hats, and they were also completely on demand to their lady enslaver. Literacy was not required for this position, but oftentimes lady enslavers preferred it because it helped with the dress making. Enslaved house mistresses were expected to present themselves to the lady enslavers' meticulous standards of dress and hygiene, oftentimes with no resources, no soap, no supplies. Fashion styles in the 1800s oftentimes took assistance to dress yourself, and enslaved house mistresses and ladies obviously did not have assistance. In their resourcefulness, they created new fashions and found ways to create piece by piece garments that they could dress themselves in. It is in these hardships and struggles during slavery that black people began to build the foundations of almost all art and culture today. Because part of the role of an enslaved headmistress was to be the lady enslaver's best friend, an enslaved headmistress could act as a resource of information to other enslaved people, creating warning systems about upcoming sales of enslaved family members or times when enslaved people could escape. Because of all of the valuable skills, trades, and arts that an enslaved housemistress provided a lady enslaver, they were one of the most valuable enslaved female roles on a plantation. Mean Girl Minion. Gossip Sounding Board. Enslaved Best Friend and Confidant. House manager and caregiver. On demand personal assistant. Spiritual guide. Healer. Stylist, fashion designer. Makeup artist. Hairstylist. Makeup production. Seamstress. Housekeeper. Nanny. You were responsible for all of these jobs with no education, resources, or background. Oftentimes we did not read or write, but if we weren't there, these white women literally couldn't get dressed or do their hair or clean their house or do their makeup or have clothes to wear or take care of their children. Or who would they gossip to? Who would heal them? Who would save them? Are you getting the point? After being completely triggered and calming back down, I feel like the real question is, what the fuck did white women do with all of that free time, other than torture us? Affluent people don't only marry more and stay married, but they also have the resources to buy the support, 
that the extended family and community used to provide in the form of babysitting, professional childcare, tutoring, coaching, therapy, expensive after-school programs, and life coaches. Meanwhile, working-class families struggle financially, emotionally, and mentally to build and maintain stability. Fictional movies and rewritten history has given us a lot of false narratives and stereotypes. Particularly, Gone with the Wind has given us a very false narrative about what is a mammy. The character in Gone with the Wind that is named Mammy is actually not a mammy. She is the head housemistress. A mammy was specifically the enslaved wet nurse and sometimes eventually nanny who was responsible for breastfeeding and looking after the lady enslaver's children. Like previously mentioned, the character would have been one of the most valuable and influential enslaved persons on the plantation. They were not required to be pretty, they were not required to be light-skinned, and they worked in the house intimately every day with the enslavers. Being light-skinned was not an immediate guarantee to material privilege. Most light-skinned enslaved people were the product of RAPE. They were sold into slavery, just like the rest of enslaved people, and the state legally made sure of this. It was about being pretty to the enslavers. No matter the skin color, the prettier you were, the closer enslavers had you to them. Whether you were sold into sex slavery or you were a concubine, you were in for a massive amount and more of rape. I wanted to highlight this point because within the black community, we are still having many discussions over colorism, featureism, and the privileges these bring. Maybe we should be approaching this topic a little bit differently and bringing in the historical context as well as listening to the stories and experiences of people who grew up in predominantly white households or predominantly white neighborhoods. That the idea that light skin brought you privilege or less slavery or less torture or less harm or less psychological abuse or less mind prisons or less suicide or less emphasize is a lie. It is a lie used to divide us. To fault light-skinned or mixed people for something they have no control over is not who we are as a community. People of color, colonized people, have had a universal truth and shared enemy that our collective action against should precede our need to other. In the next chapter, we will be diving a little bit deeper into this topic. Their presence made traders and plantation owners more productive and made their living conditions very harsh. In addition to their plantation duties, many female slaves were taken into the homes of their masters to serve their mistresses, cook, clean, and wash for them. If a mistress had too many children, the domestic worker was made to help in caring for the child. After a while, female slaves were made to take the place of low-class women paid to breastfeed babies, a practice known as wet nursing. The practice was an excuse for many white mothers to avoid breastfeeding with hopes of maintaining their stature and avoiding the messy part of motherhood. The act was perceived as self-demeaning, and women who were seen breastfeeding were often thought of as uncultured, poor, and often shunned. Doctors of the time did all they could to prove that breastfeeding was an unhealthy act for women. It is believed that doctors were paid huge sums of money to write such reports. The children of slaves grew healthy, while many white families lost their children to poor health. This made many Westerners force slave mothers to breastfeed their white children so that they could develop better and survive the early months of childhood. Once a slave mother had a child, she was quickly assigned to a white mistress and forced to breastfeed their white baby instead of her own. Young and healthy slave women were also forced to breastfeed white babies after doctors discovered that the continuous sucking of a sexually active female breast could result in lactation. While they breastfed white babies at the expense of theirs, slave mothers tried to keep their children alive by feeding them with concoctions they believed would be suitable substitutes for milk. They also gave cow milk and dirty water, which were not suitable for babies' health. This resulted in the high deaths of babies of slaves throughout the slave trade. Slave mothers often kept the white babies in their homes until the child's family felt it was time to take them back. Since the living conditions of the slaves were not the best, several white babies died. Speculating that slave mothers were killing the babies out of spite, they were later forced to move in with the family where they could be monitored. The few 19th century historians who have discussed enslaved wet nurses like Walter Johnson in River of Dark Dreams downplay the extent to which white women capitalized on black breast milk. The reason for this is because historians have focused their research on elite Southern white women while ignoring how non-elite white women use black wet nurses. By studying wet nurse advertisements in Southern newspapers, it revealed a disturbing story of white women's reliance on the exploitation of black women, 
Freshness was determined by the age of the enslaved wet nurse's infant. The older the infant, the less valuable her milk. Enslaved wet nurses whose infant died soon after childbirth was extremely valuable. White women appreciated the lack of the extra encumbrance, knowing full well that more time and resources would be spent on their own children. Wet nursing did not end after slavery, and many Southern white women continued to employ black wet nurses until the practice fell out of fashion in the 20th century. Like their slave ancestors, free wet nurses were often kept from their children in addition to being forced to do other household chores, but with a severely unfair wage instead of no pay at all. In the present, only 59% of black women breastfeed, compared to 79% of white women. Certified nurse and midwife Stephanie Devane Johnson interviewed black women and found that some reject breastfeeding because of the exploited wet nurses of slavery. The use of dead bodies. The deceased and living black women's bodies were also profitable. Doctors used the diseased reproductive organs of black cadavers to facilitate gynecological research and provide education in the field of gynecology. Their organs were used as clinical matter displayed for observation and dissection so that white women's pathologies and sick bodies could be cured. Many of these medical experiments were done with no anesthesia, and these were Joseph Mengele, Angel of Death, Nazi level type of experimental procedures on black enslaved women's reproductive organs. And even though black femmes bodies have been used to create a large amount of the OBGYN medical care that exists today, black women still don't get to enjoy a lot of the benefits of that research and theft and torture and abuse and assault. Credited as the father of modern gynecology, Sims developed pioneering tools and surgical techniques related to women's reproductive health. In 1876, he was named president of the American Medical Association. In 1880, he became president of the American Gynecology Society, an organization he helped found. The 19th century physician has been lionized with a half a dozen statues around the country. His defenders say the southern-born slaveholder was simply a man of his time for whom the end justified the means, and that enslaved women with fistulas were likely to have wanted the treatment badly enough that they would have agreed to take part in his experiments. But history hasn't recorded their voices, and consent from their owners, who had a strong financial interest in their recovery, was the only legal requirement of the time. While most health care took place on plantations, some stubborn cases were brought to physicians like Sims, who patched up enslaved workers so they could produce and reproduce for their masters again. Otherwise, they were useless to their owners. If the patient's owners provided clothing and paid taxes, Sims effectively took temporary ownership of the woman until the treatment was completed. He later reflected in his autobiography, The Story of My Life, on the advantages he found to working on people that were essentially his property. There was never a time that I could not, at any day, have had a subject for operation. According to Sims, this was the most memorable time of his life. He first operated on an 18-year-old Lucy, who had given birth a few months prior and hadn't been able to control her bladder since. During the procedure, patients were completely naked and asked to perch on their knees and bend forward onto their elbows so their heads rested on their hands. Lucy endured an hour-long surgery, screaming and crying out in pain as nearly a dozen other doctors watched. As Sims later wrote, Lucy's agony was extreme. She became extremely ill due to his controversial use of a sponge to drain the urine away from the bladder, which led her to contract blood poisoning. I thought she was going to die. It took Lucy two or three months to recover in entirely from the effects of the operation, he wrote. For a long time, Sims' fistula surgeries were not successful. After 30 operations on one woman, a 70-year-old enslaved woman named Anarka, who had had a very traumatic labor and delivery, he finally perfected his method after four years of experimentation. Afterwards, he began to practice on white women using anesthesia, which was new to the medical field at the time. While some doctors didn't trust anesthesia, Sims' decision to not use it or any other numbing technique was based on his misguided belief that black people didn't experience pain like white people did. It's a notion that persists today according to the study conducted at the University of Virginia and published in the April 4, 2016 Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. When any of Sims' patients died, the blame, according to him, lay squarely with the sloth and ignorance of their mothers and the black midwives who attended to them. He did not believe anything was wrong with his methods. 
experimenting on enslaved children. Writer and medical ethicist Harriet Washington says Sims' racist beliefs affected more than his gynecological experiments. Before and after his gynecological experiments, he also tested surgical treatments on enslaved black children in an effort to treat neonatal tetanus? Tet anus? With little to no success. Sims also believed that African Americans were less intelligent than white people and thought it was because their skulls grew too quickly around their brain. He would operate on African American children using a shoemaker's tool to pry their bones apart and loosen their skulls. Doctor enslavers would get enslaved women addicted to morphine so that they could better control their behavior and because the addiction would weaken their will to resist repeated procedures. To accomplish the sterilizations, practitioners lied to patients, forged consent forms, or falsified medical records to reflect an abdectomy or a gallbladder removal. In 1969, Bernard Burleson considered a mass proposal to use fertility control agents that would be available in 5 to 15 years and would be included in the water supply in urban areas. In 1970, doctors revealed the coercion of hundreds of thousands of black women into agreeing to sterilization by conditioning medical services or consent to the operations. And by conditioning, they mean predatory coercion. The American public associates welfare payments to single mothers with black welfare queen who deliberately gets pregnant to increase the amount of their monthly check. The welfare queen represents laziness, trickery, and economic burden all wrapped in one powerful image. And really what the welfare queen represents to white people, what they really mean when they are saying that is that there is a black woman who is getting money because of her womb that we are not profiting off of. It's giving very if we can't have it, no one can, even though it's a human being and it's never belonged to anyone, especially not us in the first place. To understand the widespread sterilization of black women, you must first understand the eugenics movement and scientific racism. Scientific racists use erroneous, biased, and misconstrued evidence to claim that white people were superior to everybody else. From this, eugenics, or the concept of improving humanity's genetics, was born. Using these twisted ideologies, social reformers, doctors, scientists, and legislators across the country pushed for forced sterilization laws that would keep undesirables at bay. Undesirables included the disabled, the mentally ill, promiscuous white women, Native Americans, Mexicans, Asians, and disproportionately, black women. Long stereotyped as unintelligent, lascivious Jezebels, Black women, especially poor ones, were prime targets for eugenicists. By 1935, 41 states had laws or pending laws allowing compulsory sterilization. Some women underwent the horrifying procedure in asylums or prison, while others were swindled into signing the right papers at their local doctor's office. In Alabama, two poor black sisters, age 12 and 14, were sterilized when their illiterate mother signed an X on a piece of paper she thought would give them birth control. In Sunflower County, Mississippi, the area's black women were routinely sterilized without their consent. One such woman was Fannie Lou Hamer, who went on to be a civil rights activist. But let's talk about my dear home state of North Carolina. A third of the forced sterilizations there took place on girls under the age of 18. To make matters worse, while most states abandoned their forced sterilization programs after World World War II because they didn't like being compared to Nazis, North Carolina increased funding for its program and didn't stop until 1974. It seems like if white colonizers and settlers couldn't profit on black wombs and children, then they really didn't want them to exist. W.E.B. Du Bois wrote about black women and birth control in a pamphlet titled Black Folk and Birth Control. He states, Clash of ideals between those Negroes striving to improve their economic position and those whose religious faith made the lamation of children a sin. The result among more intelligent class was a postponement of marriage, which greatly decreased the number of children. Today, among the class of Negroes, few men marry before 30 and numbers of them after 40. The marriage of women of this class has similarly been postponed. In addition to this, the low income which Negroes receive make bachelor and spinsterhood widespread. 
with the naturally resultant lowering in some cases of sex standards. On the other hand, the mass of ignorant Negroes still breed carelessly and dangerously so that the increase among Negroes, even more than the increase among whites, is from that part of the population least intelligent and fit and least able to rear their children properly. I really liked Du Bois. He was a communist. But in these two paragraphs right here, I think we can see where there are some biases that probably interfered with some of their revolutionary action. To think after going through all of the history and the suffering through slavery, did Du Bois somehow forget? How could you say that we breed carelessly and disastrously when we were freshly out of hundreds of years of slavery in which we were bred carelessly and disastrously? To continue that narrative in black leadership is violence. I raised my kids the same way my mom and daddy raised me. I kicked my kids' ass like my daddy kicked my ass. Did you know whippings and ass beatings weren't originally a black thing? It was literally beaten into us. In pre-colonial West Africa, many cultures saw children as sacred or pure, and no evidence reveals ritualistic beatings of children. Enter the Europeans, who often believed children were born in sin and needed to be beaten into submission and goodness. Whipping was quite common among them. When indoctrinated as slaves, Africans watched masters not only the heads of plantations, but the heads of slave families beat and whipped their children. It became common for a mother to physically harm her children for tiny and normal childlike infractions, like getting dirty, playing, showing negative emotions like anger or attitude, to protect them from the wrath of the slave master. Beatings were supposed to make children obedient and good slaves. In Christian sermons tailored for slaves, the popular line, spare the rod, spoil the child, became the common rhetoric of parents. In the same vein of God's relationship with his children and the master's relationship with his slaves, complete obedience was desired. For the past 400 years, the violent white supremacist acts of slave beating and lynching raised generations of blacks who saw violence as the correct way to stop normal childhood or teenage behavior and protect their kids from a world that doesn't allow for behavior mistakes in black kids. In southern states where corporal punishment is allowed in schools with parent permission, black students are five times more likely to be hit than white students for the same offenses. Black parents are two times more likely than any other race to use corporal punishment, while white corporal punishment rates have gone down. It's no coincidence that suicide rates among black children have doubled and decreased among white ones. Despite the folks who insist that they regularly got their ass beat as children and turned out fine, there are consequences. Research shows spanked and beaten kids are more likely to be delinquent delinquent, run away, exhibit or accept abuse in their intimate relationships, grapple with depression, and commit suicide. Between 2006 and 2015, more than 3,600 black kids were killed as a result of routine abuse gone fatally wrong, roughly 360 a year. That means black children are more likely to die at the hands of a parent than a police officer. And what exactly is the payoff? Many blacks believe whippings and slaps or punches to the face, even ones broadcast on social media meant to humiliate, are effective deterrents for teen pregnancy or crime when statistics about single parent homes and mass incarceration say otherwise. Historian Nell Irvin Painter describes the effects of the abuses of slavery as soul murder. If enslaved peoples were the most valuable commodity, if the breeding camps and habitual RAP was more profitable to white people than land they had stolen from indigenous people, and if slavers received reparations for the black wombs and lives they sadistically, psychopathically stole, then America was built on genociding indigenous peoples for land, breeding black enslaved people for labor, habitual sexual exploitation, and the kidnapping of black parents' children. White people, it is more likely that your great-grandfather and his great-grandfather and his grandfather is a bloodline of habitual, murderous, psychopathic rapists than it is that you came from revolutionary, heroic abolitionist. It's a horrifying thought, I know. Take a self-care day, process it, then get the fuck over it because we need to overthrow the state we have shit to do. And if that upsets you, go look at your family tree and throw all of your blame that way. They're the reason you're having to deal with this in your lifetime. You can't claim that you aren't your great-grandfather or your ancestors or you aren't responsible if you don't acknowledge what actually fucking happened. It's one of the first steps of healing.
You cannot heal. You cannot be an accomplice or an ally until you actually process the trauma that white supremacy, colonization, imperialization, and all the lives of white women have caused. And seriously, as I was doing this research, I'm starting to get confused exactly what the superiority complex or the or, or the supremacy is, because white enslavers and white people just historically can't seem to keep their fucking hands off of black people or people of color. They can't keep their hands off us, off our culture, off our music, off of everything that we create, because historically they're used to it being theirs. There is no white culture because all culture was created by brown people in service to white people's luxury. Honestly, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what white people were doing with all that time and and what part of this country they actually built other than the racism, exploitation, like all the bad things. For over 200 years, black Americans have had no autonomy over their bodies and have been suffering the generational trauma, even within our own community. White people have never had to ask for our consent, and oftentimes still don't. The United States of America as a country could only exist with slavery, and slavery could only exist by nullifying black parenthood and black parents' moral claim to their children. There is no amount of reparations that could repay what was and continues to be done to black people in America. Even if reparations was on the table, honestly, I don't think America has the money. Because what is the monetary value of generations of our children?